Do you like challenges? Boy, I sure do. In fact, the greater the challenge, the better for me. Because it's in these times that God shows His amazing work in my life. Today, we're going to study about a Bible character that at a very young age faced the impossible. And yet that character went through boldly by faith and saw God do amazing things, not only in his life, but in an entire nation that God saved. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Impossibilities. Have you ever faced them? I know I have. And today we're going to talk about a character, David, that faced the greatest impossibility in the Bible that probably I've read myself. Not only the possibility that this young man was approximately 17 years old, but that the whole nation of Israel was petrified, including the king. And here comes this young man that said, why are you letting this man defile Israel? And he had such faith. How did he have it? And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I want to introduce two friends of mine. One, Tim Hart, a business associate. Glad that you're here today with me, Tim. Well, I'm happy to be here. I've got a lot of questions about this. I bet you do. We've been talking about that. And Pastor Howard, um, he's my pastor from our Coldwater Church. And I'm glad you're here today with us, too. I'm glad to be here, too, Dwight. Okay. Well, I know, Tim, I, you know, I can see you chomping at the bit. Go ahead, ask your question. Well, when it comes to the story of David and Goliath, I think that the natural question is, here's this young guy who's going to take on this insurmountable uh, being out there. Nobody else wants to take on this person. You know, how do you get that kind of courage? How do you get that kind of strength to say, okay, I can do that? Well, you know, Tim, um, that's a question that I've had for a long time in my life. In fact, you know, when um, you came out to Montana, um, and we went out there as a family, and uh, we were made fun of, uh, not only with our church, but some of my associates, because I had a successful business, and I had found the key, but I didn't have it. I just knew what it was, and that was quiet time with God. You know, just to get up in the morning and, and, and crack your Bible open and, and read a little bit, have a little prayer and jump up and then go to work, thinking you're going to have faith. When the trials come, guess what happens? You're a failure. You know, you're a failure because you really have not connected with the Lord. You think you have, maybe for just a moment. And I was out there and I learned to commune with God. And I'm still learning in, in a greater way. David, at 17, was communing with God. And he did it by herding sheep because he had time. He was, um, he was making um, songs up, hymns. Um, he, he played the harp. Um, that's really what gave him his courage. And the Bible says in Isaiah 30, 15, says, and quietness will be your strength. And then the Bible also says, be still and know that I am God. And I believe that was his greatest and most powerful weapon. It was truly connecting with God. Well, when you talk about that, it's not like we have, they had iPods back then, right. they had the internet, they had all these different distractions <laughs> uh, to distract your mind. So as he was herding the sheep out there, as you talk about the quiet time, uh, really a time to reflect. And, and wouldn't you say that that would be the way that he gathered and gained that inner strength to uh, uh, take on the giant? But also, because he was young, he didn't have all these perceptions of, you can't do this. Well, that's true. And I mean, let's take it. Most, most parents will, would, would relate to this. You can take your little child that's one or two years old. They can stand up and say, jump. It could be on the stairway or platform. And they'll just jump right into your arms because they have that faith. They know that my mom or my dad will catch me. They don't think about falling. They know that mom and dad's going to catch them. So when you're young, I believe that you have more faith. When we get older, we become more like the world. You know, the world tells us that things are impossible. I mean, how much... Evolution is out there. People believe in evolution. Why? Because there cannot be a God that can just create something out of nothing. But when you're young, it's no big deal at all. And David had those 17 years. I mean, he didn't herd sheep for 17 years, but when he was out there in the quiet with no iPods, no internet, no television, he had time to commune with God and to become very faithful. And, and, and by the way, he didn't just go and beat, he didn't even know he was going to fight this giant. But God was preparing him not just to have quiet time, but he prepared him in some other things, and like a bear. I, I think he took a bear and a lion, and I don't, know if, I don't think he did it by a sling, did he? Well, the Bible says he took the bear by the beard, oh, man. and he slew the bear. So uh, David had an experience in, uh, in seeing God's power in his life. 
You know, something jumps out at me from what you're talking about. You know, we talk about David's faithfulness to God and the time he spent, but something else that the story brings out is David had a real love for God. Amen. And, and that, you see that as, as he comes out to the battlefield, the Bible tells us, the story's in 1 Samuel 17, and uh, the Bible tells us in verse 16, the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So here's Goliath, this giant, coming out, and if you read through the passage, He's coming out and he defies their, their God. He defies their nation. And, and he's doing this day after day after day after day. But when you come down to verse 23, something else happens here. David has come out to the battlefield for the first time. And the Bible says, then as he talked with them, David, he's talking with the, with the Israelites. And, and where's this at again? Because I want everyone, if, if you're not, if you don't have your Bibles, grab your Bibles because this, we're trying to get this Bible to come alive for you so that you'll learn to love the Word like we love the Word. So it's in where? Yeah, now? it's first, first Samuel chapter 17 is where okay. we find the story. And it's in verse uh, 23 that we're looking at. David is here talking with uh, the Israelite uh, soldiers. And the Bible says, During this time the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, uh, came out. He came out saying these same things yeah. against the God of heaven. He spoke according to the same words, and then it says, So David heard them. So this was the first time that David had encountered the words of this giant. And when he heard them, he, 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 was, he was incensed. I mean, have, have you ever had some, uh, an instance when somebody's talked about somebody you yes, care about? absolutely. And, and, and how does it make you feel? I, I, I want to... You know, I have to be careful about the flesh, but you I... You want to take action, don't you? <laughs> I wanna, I wanna, <laughs> he gets all riled up. But, but why didn't the other people hear this? I mean, they were listening the whole time, but yet they didn't take action. And then all 40 days, days worth. Well, yes. I mean, what do you do for 40 <laughs> days? I, they had to be, you know, I, I think they just had to be deadened by, you know, they, their fear had such a hold on them. And, 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 you know, every time that we, we don't step forward when God calls us to take a, a step of courage or in anything in life where we don't uh, take a courageous step when we cower, it gets easier and easier and easier. Here they were 40 days, and I think they just were deadened to the whole thing. Their fear had gripped them, and they well, couldn't get free from it. Well, and, and to me, it goes right back hurting sheep, so to speak. It wasn't just about hurting sheep. It was taking time with God, and God had him hurting sheep because he was learning about people through the sheep. I mean, like you've mentioned, what, what's that text? Uh, is that in Isaiah about? Yeah, Isaiah 53, it tells that all, all we like sheep have gone astray. Gone That's what sheep do. <laughs> That's right. They turn to their own way. They turn to their own way, and they'll, and they'll do the craziest things. But if, if you go back to there, here's David's brothers that are supposedly important because David's not important. He's, he's herding these sheep, sitting there making these these little songs, and here's his brothers that are important with the Israelites, you know, part of the war. Here's Saul the king. Here's all these people, and they hear this Goliath for, for those 40 days, just blaspheming the name of God. And um, again, it didn't bother me. You know, what else is really neat um, is in the Bible here, and you probably got it right, right on your text here, but um, they were giving, you know, the, Saul was saying, hey, if any one of you can slay this giant, I'm going to give you my daughter. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to get half the kingdom. <laughs> and they still wouldn't go. And they still wouldn't hey, go. Hey, that's a lot of loot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think about that. And yet they still, and, and I can just, I can see it now because, I, because it happens within our own lives. Like, well, you know, I'd like that. But really, you know, Mark, you're my friend. Why don't you go do it? I'll cheer you on the whole way. You know, what, they might have got accustomed to it, but there still was that. They did not trust in the, in the God that they believed in. That's right, that's right. Another thing that makes me think of is, is how many people today are looking for uh, an experience with God that, that gives them something. What am I gonna get out of this? Yes. What am I gonna get out of this? And when David heard the words, the Bible says, just like you said, that the, the, the men, when Goliath came out, and they were all petrified, and David's just incensed at it, and they said, uh, hey, look, the king says he's gonna give his daughter, and he's gonna give all this loot and everything else, and David said, are you telling me, in essence, and I'm paraphrasing yeah. here, are you telling me that, that the king's got to give us something to do what we're supposed to be doing, what we're committed to God to do in the first place? And it's kind of like if, if, if someone, you know, we're all men here and we're married, but if someone is, is taking our wife, kidnapped our wife, and then people come around and say, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, you know, $100,000 <laughs> if you go take care of your wife, you know, you, you, you go grab her back. I mean, I'm going to get mad at that person that offered me. You mean to tell me I don't love my wife enough? That I'm, I don't need any money. I love her so much. And that's what Dave was trying to say. He didn't need anything. He, could, he was so furious because of what that giant was saying about his God. Because he'd had communion. He was a true friend of God. 
And, you know, he did not even need any armor, too. That's what I found. Yeah. You know, because normally, you know, if you watch some of the TV shows out there and some of the battles that they had, they were quite bloody and, uh, you know, uh, very mean-spirited. I mean, the whole thing. And here he was, no, I'm just going to go pick up these five stones and along the way, and I'm going to take care of that giant. Well, and you think about it. In fact, we're going we're gonna to talk about that after this break. I want to talk about why he didn't wear that armor, one of the reasons he started to. And um, we'll talk about that after we come back. We're going to have a short break, an important break, but don't go away because this is so exciting. We'll talk to you in just a few minutes. Now available in the King James and New King James versions, the new Remnant Study Bible has all the study aid serious Bible students have come to expect, like book introductions and outlines, an extensive concordance, over 40,000 cross-references, words of Christ in red, maps and charts. But with hundreds of other study Bibles on the market, the Remnant Study Bible stands head and shoulders above the rest. Not only because it's everything you've always needed in a study Bible, but because it takes studying the Bible to an entirely new level. From the hottest pen since the Bible prophets, the masterful commentary of E.G. White is now included alongside the New King James Bible text. As you read, these thought-provoking nuggets stand out from the main Bible text and offer spirit-filled insight to bring text to life in an inspiring and practical way. If we stopped right there, this Bible would be an invaluable resource to every home. But keep watching, we're just getting started. The Remnant Study Bible offers extensive study tools that not only help you understand, but also enable you to share these truths with others in a whole new and effective way. Feel confident as you share on topics such as the prophecies in Daniel chapters 2, 7, and 8, and the 2300-day prophecy. See the plan of salvation plainly revealed in the sanctuary and study the miracles and parables of Jesus in a deeper way than ever before. But perhaps one of the most powerful features of the Remnant Study Bible is the built-in Bible chain reference, a ready-to-go Bible study system that will allow you to effectively guide yourself or a student through major Bible teaching. Select the topic for study from the 20 included topics and turn to the first text. To help you find the text quickly, a chain link has been placed to the side of the text that expands the entire passage to be read. After you read and discuss the verse, a reference to the next text in the chain is found at the end of the passage. These subjects are made crystal clear as the Bible interprets itself. Remnant has teamed with Thomas Nelson Publishers, working together for over a year, making this the best study Bible ever offered at any price. After the team of over 30 Spirit-led contributors prayerfully and carefully selected the comments of E.G. White, we compiled the notes, images, tools, and resources, and these were all edited by the world-class editing team at Thomas Nelson. We have gone to great lengths to make this Bible one that you will be confident to use as you study and share. The Apostle Peter makes a bold call to all generations to be part of God's special forces team. We have done our very best to provide you with the most powerful sword of truth available. If you would like more information or to order now, call 1-800-423-1319 or visit www.remnantpublications.com. To order, you can call 1-800-423-1319 or visit remnantpublications.com. Enter or mention product code Amazing Facts and save 5%. Don't wait. Order now. And we're back. And I'll tell you what, we were just talking about the armor, but I want to go back just a little bit before the armor because we were talking about that as we had this commercial break, what about David's brothers? I mean, he comes up to David's brothers. What's going on before we get to the army? Because that happened just before the armor. What, what's going on with, with David and his brothers when he comes up to him to give him food? Well, I think it's just like in our life today, don't you? Is that uh, you have so many people always trying to beat you down. You cannot do that. You need this and this. You need more stuff to yeah. accomplish your goal. And, and as always, um, you don't always need more stuff. Yeah, or questioning your motives because they said, uh, oh, David, you're, you're not, you're the only reason you're out here is because you want to get into, you want to see a fight. Right. You know, so they'll question your motives. They say, well, you're not, you're the only reason you're trying to do what you're doing is because you want glory for yourself or you want this or you want that, you know, and uh, it's funny. Sometimes the people that are closest to us can, can be well-meaning, but 
be our greatest hindrances before we fight the real battle. And, and why is that? Most of the time, I think, you know, because I've, I've felt this way before. If someone stands up for the Lord and, and I knew that I wasn't, what do I want to do? I want to bash the messenger. And I'm going to find there is weak points or her weak points. So what? It makes me look better. It's not because I really don't like them. It's because I feel guilty. And I imagine the brothers sitting there for 40 days listening to that. And I, I, I imagine they were praying to the God of heaven, please, Lord, give this giant a heart attack. You know, you are the God of heaven. Take this giant down. But there was that faith. And here comes Stephen said, how can you let this giant defy and blaspheme the name of God? And now his brothers gets upset because why? They felt guilty. You know, e even though they probably loved the, the brother David, they just felt guilty. But David said, you can't do this. I'm not here for anything. This just can't happen. And now he goes, now he goes to Saul, <laughs> King Saul, and, and, and something that's always amazed me. 17 years old. Can you imagine? I, I've got a son. He's 22 right now. But even at 22, if, if we're fighting a nation and we can't win this nation, we've got, got the stalemate. And, and, and my son at 22 goes to, you know, the president of the United States and said, let me take him on. What, what do you think the president's going to say? I mean, like, put this guy in the nut house. Yeah. I mean, I wonder what Saul was thinking. Well, also, he's going to say, well, I've got God on my side. And in this day and age, if somebody, uh, how often does it happen? You say, well, praise God. God helped me. God's going to give me the power and the strength to get through all this. Right away, people are like, oh, yeah, right. one of those God people yeah. always, you know, you can't do it like that. That's not how it's going to work. And, and, and I know that I've got a relative like that. That it's always, every time somebody says, you know, they've got God and their spirit, and that's how they're accomplishing their goals, he dismisses them right away. And why do you think that is? Don't you think it's the same thing with David and his brothers? The guiltiness. The guiltiness, and they, and they want to put you on. But, but I think one of the reasons why we as, a, as, as Christians many times fail, first, we do not, we've not had real communion with God on a daily basis. We don't get up in the morning like David. You know, if you're reading the Psalms, it, it said that he got up and, and God awakened him. We don't have that. And then we don't live the walk. We talk it. We might open our Bible and Bible thump them, but we're not living it. And David was willing to live it out so much that even if his brothers made fun of him or, or pushed him down, the next thing he went to Saul and he said, Saul, by God's grace, you know, and he couldn't say, I believe in God and you don't because the whole nation of Israel believe in God. So he went to King Saul and said, here, I know that, you know, that God is with me because I fought a lion and this is what I did and there was a bear and I grabbed him by the beard and I tore him apart and the spirit came upon me and I believe the same thing with this giant. He's nothing in the hands of God and he gave the glory to God and, and it's amazing. Then Saul did something that I thought was very kind. David had no armor. He had a slingshot, you know, so Saul said, here, I'll give you my armor. And, and uh, what happened with that? I mean, well, you know, you've amazing. got to picture it because the Bible says that Saul was head and shoulders taller than every man in Israel. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the, the, even, even the strong, you know, uh, 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 sturdy guys in Israel, Saul was taller and, and broader. And so you got to imagine the 17 year old kid, even if he was healthy and in good shape, yeah. trying to put on the armor of Saul and walk around in this stuff. And, uh, and he tried it. He did. I mean, how far did he get? I mean, it's funny because it, when I read the Bible, it's kind of saying, you know, I, I can just, I can picture because he puts on this mace that's metal, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, uh, I don't know, the mace, it's like, um, like chain or something across him to protect his chest. He's got the helmet, he's got the spear, he's got all this armor. And I can just see him as he's getting down the hill like, this just isn't going to work. That's too heavy. And, I, and, and he said, I haven't tested it yet, yeah. which, which. So what's that mean? I haven't tested it. Well, yet. and how often today, you know, I mean, you, what, what you've got there is you've got Saul. I mean, Saul had been out there 40 days and that armor didn't win him any battles. That's right. And, and how often is it today that somebody wants to, wants to take their, their method of uh, alleged success and say, this is what you've got to follow if you're going to succeed too, uh, when the reality is Saul hadn't been succeeding at all. Well, how do we relate this story of David and Goliath and, and go forward and, and put it into our everyday life? Well, that's a good question, but I want to finish this. We need to finish it quickly. But so he comes back up and he said, and he was very nice. I mean, I think as a Christians, we should be very kind to people. And, and of course, Saul was a, a Christian also. And, but he still walked up and said, you know, Saul, I appreciate the army. You're the king. I respect you, but I haven't tested it. Please let me fight the battle. Like you said, pastor, 
in the strength that God has given me, in my, in my own experience. And that's the thing. And he went down there. He picked those five stones up. He put, put it in a sling. He slung that sling around, and he hit his mark right in the forehead. And, of course, some people think that the stone killed the giant, but it really didn't. Obviously, he fell over, and he, he, he cut his head off. And, and I think there's another point there that, you know, maybe to take it very quickly, that when, he, when we do slay the giants of the land, so to speak, we can't just knock them out because they're going to revive. That's right. He killed them. He made sure he was dead. He cut off his head. But you know when he went down there and, 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 and Goliath was blaspheming and said, I am going to feed you to the birds. What did David say? I'm sorry, I'm going to feed you to the birds. I'm going to cut your head off. I mean, he, he was assured of what he was going to do. Well, you know what he said? He said, he said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the God of Israel who you've defied. Yeah. So, so when he was fighting his battles and, and, and going into Tim's uh, qu question that he asked just a moment ago, um, how do we apply it today? I mean, one big lesson we can learn is, is that when we're facing these, these obstacles, these seemingly impossible obstacles of life, if we would realize that we're not, if we're fighting in the name of God, if we're fighting for His cause, we're not fighting alone. It's not our battle, it's His battle. That's right. And, and, I, and I like the statement that I use all the time when, when, I, when I come up to an impossibility and, and having a ministry, man, you have, it's faith-based. And uh, it just seems like every day there's impossibilities. And so I, I put this in my mind all the time. There's no way you can have miracles of God unless it's impossible for you. Because otherwise then we think we're fighting it in our own strength. So my impossibilities are God's opportunities. Right. We ought to be happy. We ought to be just on the side cheerleading and saying, Praise the Lord, this is an impossibility, and God can take care of this. But then we have to step out in faith. And that's, that's what happens to most people. And I think that's where we started out with, with David to begin with. David was young, but he was communing with God. He had faith. He went out and walked out, not by sight, not by feeling, but knowing there was a God in heaven, and he would be the one that would fight for him. But he had to walk out and do the best that he could. And that, to me, that's the bottom line issue. If we do not have the faith to commune with God, we won't have the faith. Get in the Word and study that and then be happy for those impossibilities. That's right. Get in the Word and, and know God for who He is. That's Develop right. a love for God, a, a, an admiration and, a, a, that, that burns within your heart like David had to where that love drives you and compels you to do what's right. That's right. No matter if our family members make fun of us or whatever. And before we end, we're going to take a quick break and see some great and neat things happening here at Redmond Publications. Don't go away because we'll be right back. Hey, I'm Larry, and today we want to give you an inside look at what happens at Remnant Publications. We're going to start with Steve at the shipping department. You ready? Let's go! Steve has been working in the Remnant shipping department for about four years now. There's a lot of books at Remnant, and whenever an order comes in, Steve carefully gathers them all together. He keeps the books very organized so he can find them quickly. And he really enjoys what he does. For him, it's not just a job, it's a ministry. After the books have been weighed, they're boxed up and shipped out right away. Now this is really exciting. You're looking at over 500 boxes filled with Spirit of Prophecy books. Steve is taking them to the mail truck, where they will be shipped out to places all around the world. Some days, the Remnant staff spends time stuffing envelopes. Today, they're stuffing over 8,000 of them. Most of the employees of Remnant say they feel like they're working with a family and not just another company. I guess not everyone likes to be on camera. Well, there you have it. That's an inside look at what happens at the shipping department at Remnant Publications. The U.S. administration says it's just a technical matter. They just want to make a slight change in the law to give the government the power to see the names of anyone's email correspondence and their web browsing history without the messy complication of asking a judge for permission. But in reality, wrote the New York Times, it is far more than a technical change. The administration's request is an unnecessary and disappointing step backward toward more intrusive surveillance. The right to privacy is a key element of the U.S. Constitution. After the September 11 terrorist attacks, this and other provisions of the U.S. Constitution were pushed aside by the Bush administration in favor of nearly unbridled surveillance. Internal investigations of the FBI and the Pentagon found widespread misuse of this power, 
and little oversight into how it was wielded. Instead of taking requests for email surveillance before a judge, the administration is proposing changes that would allow huge numbers of new electronic communications to be examined with no judicial oversight. The loss of constitutional principles is predicted in prophecy. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 451, tells us that the United States shall repudiate every principle of its Constitution. I'm Hal Mayer, reminding you to keep the faith. important point that will be the pivotal point of this show and the next shows to come and that is okay Dwight so how do we make this practical how do the viewers make this practical in their lives reading David and Goliath and we've come up with three points number one you've got to have personal time with Jesus Christ you can't just read a text in the Bible have a 30 second prayer and jump up and get on your busy schedule you need to learn to take time with God just like you would your spouse or your family or your friends. Take time. Number two, you need to make sure that no matter what your family, your friends, your acquaintances, maybe your church members talk about, or uh, I call them doomsayers or naysayers, say it, it can't happen, it will never happen, just like they did with David. You have got to have that faith that Christ will take all things under His glory and the impossibilities with God are possibilities. And number three, I want to reiterate that, don't focus on the impossibilities. When you start doing that, the devil will get in there and work on your discouragements. So don't focus on that. Focus on Jesus Christ and what he can do for you, and he will. If you will do that, the Bible will come alive for you. In the meantime, until we see you again, remember you too can have a better way of life. Please don't put it off. By working together, 1.7 million copies of The Passion of Love were distributed around the country, resulting in an unprecedented partnership with Walmart that led to over a thousand Bible studies. By working together, over six million copies of the Ten Commandments twice removed were shared around the world, resulting in more than 20 churches now keeping the Bible Sabbath. By working together, we have shipped almost a million Bibles to spiritually thirsty Christians in Africa, touching the lives of 20 million people for Christ. Working together is what allows Remnant Publications to spread truth-filled books around the world to hasten the Lord's coming. Will you join us in that mission? Will you help us reach the world for Jesus, one book at a time?